Hello again, and welcome to Foreplay Radio Sex Therapy. I'm your host, certified sex therapist Lori Watson, author of Wanting Sex Again, and blogger at Psychology Today and WebMD. And I have with me Dr. Adam Matthews, my co-host, who's a couples therapist, psychotherapist, and president of NCAMFT. Foreplay is dedicated to helping couples keep it hot. Thanks for listening. Now on to today's topic. Hey, everybody. It's Foreplay Radio Sex Therapy. This is your sex therapist, Lori Watson. And your couples therapist, Dr. Adam Matthews. And we are going to talk about the last horseman that Gottman has talked about in terms of the four horsemen of the apocalypse that basically lead to divorce. And we've done the other three. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about criticism today. And listen, I've got a criticism. Okay. Of the world. What is it? What is up with effing daylight savings time? Adam. I hate it so much. You do? Yes. Why do you what, hate it? Why do I hate it? Because my children were oh. up at 530 in the morning oh. ready to go. Painful. And I, who get up before them, was up at 430 oh, for the no. last two nights, up at 430. Oh, Adam. Wide awake. It ruins my life. And then- You six, get up at 530 most days? Yes. Dude, no to. wonder you're tired. No, it's I, I how, have to. How do you, what do you because do at 530? I go work out. I'm by myself. I sit in silence. Like oh, this is where you get your rejuvenation. Is, yes, it's your like, you time. Because otherwise, what time do you go to bed? Uh, Ten. Ten thirty. You're a man. You I, don't need as much sleep. Uh, maybe I guess I, I am. So I am not a man, a Lori. I appreciate every time you point that out. I'm, I'm just super excited. Such a man. You know, I'm such a man. But this is it's dude. awful. And then by by six thirty. Uh, or seven thirty, you feel like it's been it's it's yeah, it's like you've lived a whole day. You've lived more than a whole day. <laughs> oh, I'm it's so like a day and a half. sorry. So that is my criticism of the world. Get on board. We don't need to be held hostage by some 18th century agrarian like useful thing or whatever it was back then. Let's modernize. Do away with it. I Down like with the, daylight I savings like it, time. Though, because I can walk in the morning. You know, because you, you couldn't like, walk in the morning before. Well, it's light. Okay, it's light. Okay, I'm saying you can walk in the dark. Get a headlamp. I'll get you a headlamp. <laughs> I'll get you. <laughs> you got to come walk with light. me. Is what you got to do. All right. If but, you're going to get me up in the morning, gee, Okay. But criticism. Okay, in marriage, let's talk about what it is. Right. Criticism is essentially a complaint that's gone bad. Oh yeah. Right. Because. We I'm really to, good at this one. This is this is my specialty. Is this is this Criticism. the one that comes? Is this the one that comes out? With yeah. Derek? So my husband he leads a four day training that is kind of a personal growth seminar, and he's been doing this f- most of our marriage. He's done like 150 of them. He's fabulous. It's a Christian based one, but I went through it when he was not the leader, and <clears throat> this group kind of stands around and says, you know, how they perceive you and stuff, and and they all perceive me as critical. Uh-oh. I will say, and that Uh-oh. was not a really good time in our marriage back then. Okay. But, but I, grown, I have reformed. It's I have not, reformed. It's I, not something that's chronic. Yeah, and we'll talk about how to how to reform. So, but I do want to differentiate between it's okay to have complaint in marriage. Right? You would have to be different. dead not to like yeah. know the differences between you and your partner and things that drive you crazy. Yeah. So part of what we're going to talk about is how to differentiate between criticism and complaint, and how to have healthy complaint. Versus unhealthy criticism. Okay. But you're going to be able to notice criticism because it is it attacks the core of somebody else's character. Oh, yeah. Well, I didn't do that, but I did have lots of suggestions. <laughs> suggestions, right. Right. Okay. So Lori's going to personalize throughout. <clears throat> yeah, I'm going to definitely <laughs> defend this whole thing, man. I'm going to defend. Right. But even when it's not intended, though, what what criticism does. You is know vil- I'm it, critical, Adam. Vil- you know I have that, like, <laughs> like that critical part. Yeah. I mean, you're a therapist. You're supposed to pick things apart. So there's the good. Right. There's. You can pick up on. I'm a bug finder. You're a bug finder, but criticism vilifies the other person. Like okay. Whether it's intended to or not, it vilifies the other person. It makes them bad. But I think what we do sometimes when people are critical, what they're doing is they are searching for a reason, an explanation for their negative feelings. Mm-hmm. Right. They're searching for why do why do I feel so bad? Right. And they're and, blaming the other. And they're blaming the other. They they ought, we go to blame. Right. So mm-hmm. you'll hear. Criticism starts with a lot of you statements, right? Mm-hmm, so it's exactly. you always, you never, 
how could you? Why would you do this? I can't believe you. The I can't believe you. I think I get a lot of people when we talk about I statements and start to learn I statements. They go to that <laughs> one, right? They think that's an I statement, but that's that's a. <laughs> I can't believe you would do this. Yeah, that's to a, me. That's right. That's a stealth you statement. Right? Yeah, that's a stealth. Absolutely. <laughs> it's like so it's, tricky. It's, it's a. It sneaks I think in the that you're really there. selfish. <laughs> that's yes, an I statement. That's right? an I statement. I think you're a huge jerk. You know. Yeah, and uh, you know, I think the most common criticism that betrays that people are in the power struggle is they say, I've I've married a selfish person. That's right. You know, yeah. I, obviously, I've just married a selfish person. And so many people say that. Yeah. I mean, don't you find that in couples therapy? Oh, like all almost time. all the time they come in with that complaint. The other one I have that I think is also super critical, but it's, it's again, it's stealthy. It is the, we just must not be compatible. Yeah. Right? I just, married the wrong person. We I married the wrong person. Right. Mm -hmm. Which is just so it's so sneaky, but it's so hurtful because it still does that. It says if you were it's saying if you were a better person, if there was not so much wrong with you, then we would be okay. Sure. Right. And I think what criticism tends to do to us internally is it takes us toward hyperbole. It takes us for toward absolutes. Yes. It takes us toward it. It takes us toward like worst case scenarios. Mm -hmm. Right. Because it just uh, oftentimes. It builds up in us because we're not speaking. We'll talk about this in a little bit. And we're not speaking directly about how we feel. So it just builds and builds and builds. And then we're the the thing about criticism, too, is that to your partner, criticism feels like it comes out of nowhere Mm -hmm. oftentimes. Mm -hmm. Like, how did we just end up in this conversation? I was sitting with a couple the other day that this happened so quickly or all of a sudden they were in a their conversation was just going along like they were both happy. They're both describing things. And then all of a sudden through a lot of different reasons, like all of a sudden one of them just got super critical of the other and the other person goes, where did that, I don't, how did we get into this conversation? Right. Right. How now did we, I am how not did we get safe here? with you. That's right. You were right. talking about something and suddenly you lapse into criticism. Yeah. I, I think this is too more traditionally the anxiously attached person, the mm-hmm. pursuing partner would tend Absolutely. more toward criticism. I do think that distancing partners, when they feel cornered, will, will counter back with criticism as well. And that's, mm-hmm a later stage in the power struggle, a more dangerous stage in the power struggle, um, you know, when they're basically attack attacking, Mm -hmm. you know, so that's problematic. But this is, yeah, this is, it's more than just saying I don't like something. It's, it's kind of warfare. Yeah, I think the I think you bring up a good point about the. And I didn't do that early in the marriage, <laughs> just for the record. <laughs> this is Lori's practicing what's called defense defensiveness. <laughs> Go listen to our podcast on defensiveness. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think what you're talking about about the power struggle is important because I think the distancing partner will come back. They're trying to make it stop. Mm-hmm. They're oftentimes trying to make the criticism stop, mm-hmm. and so they come back with something that is hurtful, so that the critical partner will. Will yeah, back, back off. off. Right. Um, yeah. And so people that are more critical, this is the horseman they struggle with the most. Um, they'll say what they're being critical to. And what's often happening, though, is that that's not their first line of defense, though. Mm-hmm. Like you were saying, they feel backed into the corner. And so they're trying to make it stop. Yeah. Their first line of defense would be the shutdown. Yeah. And they often go to stonewalling. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, but they can counterattack. Absolutely. Yeah. So, but here's why criticism is so dangerous in our relationships. One, it just paves the way for the other horseman when it is a pervasive part of our relationship pattern, right? Mm-hmm. It, it, it just, it, it kind of, it, it lays down the groundwork for them to come in. It doesn't necessarily where it starts. So if you're the, you know, if you're the critical partner in your relationship, it doesn't mean that it starts with you, but it does mean that it just, the more we, you allow the criticism to be there, the escalation is going to go up. It's going to escalate into some of the more dangerous ones like contempt. Yeah, I think in couples therapy, when the partner who comes in, when when we see a couple, it's most obvious in the beginning, the criticism is like an obvious symptom. And it can be, I think, as a therapist, it can take you aback too. Mm. I know a lot of therapists listen to us and you know, that, that one person can look like they're the one to blame. They're easy oh, yeah. because they look so angry, and the other person often is logical and shut down, mm. and they, they don't look like they're doing anything. Yeah. But in this cycle, we know that it is dynamic, that one person is pushing, the critical person is pushing, and the shutdown person is pulling. Yeah. You I, think, know, so. I think the criticism is just their way of – is just the pursuer's way of trying to solve the problem. Like, I don't even know if they, they don't right. often see it as being critical. 
because they it is just their effort to try to fix what they perceive as being wrong in their yes, relationship. Yes, yes, they're escalating. They mm-hmm. don't they don't realize, and I think they escalate often when they don't feel like they get through. Mm-hmm. You know, so then then they just need to ramp it up and amplify further. Yeah, and I, I hear some people say too, uh, which I think is very common as well, is even if when they are aware of it, when it gets pointed out to them, they'll say things like. I, I don't know how to make it stop. Like mm-hmm. I, I don't know, or I don't know what else to do because their needs are not being met in the relationship. And so it's in an effort to get those needs met. Like they are, they, like we talked about, they're pushing, they're being critical and they're like, I don't, they don't know how to ask for the thing that they need in a way that builds togetherness. Right. Right. Like it, right. The, what they're doing is just driving a wedge in the relationship. Well, I did that when I was first married. <laughs> I did a lot of that. I, I think, you know, for me, I was, I began to kind of really track how often my husband came home early, you know, the many activities that he had on the weekend. I, I began to literally like track on the calendar are you there for me? Are you there for me and you the were, babies? You were gathering and evidence. I was gather. Gosh, I was <laughs> gathering evidence. You know, you're not here enough. Yeah, you're not able to meet my needs for connection, company, time together, yeah. all of that. Yeah, and so you're trying to say it's your responsibility to fix that. Oh yeah, fix all that. And, 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 and I became, us. you know, the more I focused on it, right, mm-hmm. the the more critical I became. Right. I mean that that's that's what's so problematic about these things is. We lose our flexibility and our creativity when we get Absolutely. trapped in the power struggle. You know, I, I could have I could have resolved it in a million different ways, but well, no. You lose the creativity, and then, but then I think it's important is you you lose the ability for you to solve your the problems with your partner. Yes, right? you lose like it's the whole two heads are better than one. Type yeah, of you thing. can't you, turn toward your partner when yeah. you view them as the enemy. Yeah, and then so it, it it robs you of some of your partner's creativity to be able to solve it together. And yes. you don't feel like you're together. So you, even if you came up with a great solution, you're not doing it together. So it's likely that your partner is going to reject that solution, right? Because it wasn't done together. Right. So um, well, let's come back yeah. and talk about some more about this and then how to fix it too. Thank you so much to all our Patreon supporters, right? Yeah. Patreon is a platform where you can directly support things that you love. We really want to expand the resources that we can be able to provide right. to you as our listeners. If you know our work touches you and our work helps you, we would be so grateful for your support. Just go to our website, foreplayrst.com, and there you can find a way to support us, and you can see our episodes and our blogs. And thank you so much, guys. Speaking with certified sex therapist Lori Watson from Awakening Center for Couples and Intimacy. Lori, what is an intensive? So an intensive is 12 to 14 hours of therapy all in one weekend. And it's a way to really make fast progress compared to weekly therapy. I mean, there's just so much more you can get done when you have a chunk of time. Overcome the challenges in your relationship and your sex life. Learn more about intensives and Awakening Center's other services at awakenloveandsex.com. At Matthews Counseling, we believe it is our job to come alongside you in whatever difficult challenges of life you are in and help you rediscover hope and to find the strength that you have to face those challenges. We strive to create a safe and comfortable place for you to explore who you want to be and identify the obstacles standing in your way. Oftentimes, the first step toward finding help is the hardest, but it can also be the bravest. Give us a call at 919-587-8018. Find us online at Matthews Counseling. Net. We look forward to working with you. Okay, Doc Adam and I are back with Foreplay Radio Sex Therapy. And we're talking about criticism, one of the four horsemen that Gottman points out as driving us toward separation and divorce. Yeah. So basically it's a bad sign if you get locked into this. Yeah, and we all fall into this, I think. I mean, with all the horsemen, we said it every time, but it's worth saying again, you know, it's all of these horsemen are a part of every marriage at some point. Yeah. We mm-hmm. all get critical. We all get defensive. It's whether it is a pattern in your relationship and whether how pervasive these horsemen are right. and your ability to catch them and, and how repair chronic from it them. becomes. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. yeah. So when we talk about how to remove criticism from our relationship for it not to be there, you know, uh, Gottman says the, the chief thing is this idea of gentle startup. And I think this idea is so misunderstood even by therapists that teach it and how they, they talk about it because they they talk about it in, often in terms or maybe I think people hear it in terms of, well, I've got to be calm and demure 
all the time. I'm not allowed to get angry. I'm not allowed to get frustrated. And that that is not what gentle startup is about. I think the the term gentle there confuses people because mm-hmm. I, I think it is more about and it's more helpful when we talk about it in terms of it is a it is straightforward comment about what you need and how you feel about what's happened, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. That it is, it's not couched in anything. It's not blaming. It's not judgmental. We still get to be frustrated and angry, right? Sure. It, it's, it's not that we can't feel those emotions, but it's non gentle means it's not attacking, mm-hmm. right? When you are bringing up these things, these complaints that you have, it's not an attacking position. It doesn't come out of nowhere. It takes into account the circumstances, right? It takes into if you're if you're wanting to bring up something heavy, right, or something that's complicated that needs a lot of conversation in a relationship, it's taking into account if your partners come home from a long day of work or if y'all have, if your kids have, you know, soccer practice. Like, it takes those things into account and in how it doesn't, it doesn't fight over text message, for instance. It doesn't have those, try to have those conversations over text mm-hmm. message, those type of things. And so, like really wanting to just try to demonstrate the difference between gentle startup and being allowed to be fully human, fully emotive, mm-hmm. and fully in those conversations with, with your partner. I, I do think that old psychology and pop psychology has often said we need to tell our partner our feelings, which means I need to tell you how upset you make me. Mm-hmm. But I really think that in terms of creating a change in a relationship, the soft startup that you're talking about should begin with the request. Yes. You know, so this is what I need from you. You come in the door late and I say, you know what, if you're going to be more than 10 minutes late, I would love for you to call me or text me. Maybe after your partner receives that, which for many people is like a lifesaver. Okay, I got that. I can do that. Now I can hang on to the fact that I can fix this problem. They're more able to hear your upset about what the problem is. You know, like, look Mm. at, you know, my dad was always late. You know, my mom would get frantic, then, then she'd be angry at us. And, and this whole late pattern starts to stress me out. And, you know, I mean, maybe then they can hear the deeper things that, and hopefully you're talking about a vulnerable way for your partner to understand your reactivity, mm. tracing it back to your childhood, tracing it back to patterns inside you versus versus making an accusation, right? You're thoughtless. Mm. You know, you you're late again, uh, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and I think that kind of direct request also really helps you stay away from blame and judgment, right? which is essential, right? That is that is essentially what, what separates healthy complaint from destructive criticism, mm-hmm. right? Is, is if it's free of those two things, and it's free of those two things when you are using the, the tried and true I statements and you are speaking directly about what you need. But oftentimes we get reactive Right. And we Mm -hmm. don't because I hear a lot of people say, well, I don't know what I need in that situation. Well, okay, maybe it's better than not to talk about it until you have been able to think through what it is. What makes it better? What makes it better? Yeah. I mean, so many people say that, that they, you know, they feel upset, but they don't really present a solution. Mm. And it's like if you can't know what makes it better, then wait, Mm. wait on that conversation. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, though, when you say directly what you need, the challenge that has to be overcome is the vulnerability that it creates. You know, this is one of my favorite topics, and but I think this is huge here because by stating directly what we need, we have the opportunity to be let down by our partner may say no. Our yes. partner may just ignore it completely. Our partner may just flat out reject it and not do it or mm-hmm. say they're going to do it and then fail us over and over again. So, it's a truly vulnerable position that we have to be okay with. I think the vast majority of people, when their partner says directly what their needs, want to be able to respond well to yeah. those things. Yeah, right? right. But it is it's difficult to to get there and put ourselves out there, even things that are super simple. Why don't we do some examples, Lori, to really kind of put some practical lessons okay, to, to what we're talking about. The co- the common criticism you actually already mentioned it uh, as one of the examples we had was you know the criticism is come on we're going to be late why can't you be ready on time right? you know what I gotta say my husband never rushes me ever ever oh my god I mean I he know. never rushes me I I don't know how he does it because sometimes I'm late uh, but he never rushes me and what's <laughs> totally crazy is I always rush him <laughs> you know it's like as soon as I'm ready then everybody should be ready yeah you know but. 
he never rushes me. That that song, Waiting on a Woman, I don't know, it's a country song, and I just think, you know, that is my husband. He truly, truly is patient with me. <laughs> I got to say. I will, well, I will, I'm just, I will talk I'm just about, giving him I, kudos. I, I, will, I mean, I need to learn his ways because this is a common complaint. I feel like I'm always waiting in life. Uh-huh. Like, my wife would say otherwise that I, but I have that I have that bad expectation that when I'm ready everybody else should be ready <laughs> yeah. and uh, and I recognize that but I still like I I'm constantly I, waiting I, I do notice it it's like he really is very patient about this and yeah, it's impressive does it's he do that impressive. does he do that when you have to get out of the car and it takes you 15 years to, to actually totally. get out of the car totally is patient so impressive I yeah. have I, I mean have, if I have to put my makeup on the last second you know once we arrive at church or I wonder if that's you know, my lipstick or whatever the deal is yeah he just like hangs out waits for me I mean he's just he doesn't – my husband is pretty easy to live with. I mean, he so really is. That's, that's impressive. I, I wonder if that's because y'all had, y'all had all boys. Like, I have two girls, and they – and so oh, yeah, both of so. them and my wife, like, I'm waiting 10, 15 minutes easy just to get out of the car, gather all of their things that they need for whatever they're doing. Like my my daughter's – like, it's, it's, it's miniature version, so it's books. <laughs> they have books. They have toys. They have – Scarves. They have sweaters. <laughs> they have extra jackets for Barrettes. if it's cold. Bur- oh, like, all the things they I have would to love. gather. All for some reason, when they get in the car, it all goes out of the bag, and then it has to all go back in the bag for them to get out of the car. So, uh, anyway, okay. common criticism. Okay, common criticism. Why can't you ever be ready on time? The gentle startup is more something like, "Hey, we're running late. It's really important to me that we get there on time." Okay, so I would, I would totally take issues with this, Adam. I would not say that's a general startup. First of all, I think a general startup should happen at a time frame when you're talking about the pattern, not in the moment. I mean, in the moment, you don't have... Okay. Okay, good. You can argue with me then. I mean, I just think if it is a chronic pattern, talking about it at a neutral time and saying, you know, I've noticed... We seem to run late. This is something that drives me crazy, and I, I really want to run on time. Um, versus in the moment, then then you're just a nag, man. That to me though builds it up because most people don't end up talking about it. Mm-hmm. So I think you like that the direct request, and maybe you could restate the direct request is, hey, I need to be there by nine nine a.m. It takes us fifteen minutes to get there. We need to leave by eight forty five. Can you please be ready by eight forty five? And maybe that's the more direct request. But I think if you don't make it in that moment. Yeah. Then it it gets it gets lost in there. I, I can see that. I can see that. And also, I like like maybe you know what? I need to leave by eight forty five. It's cool if if you guys need to go late. I think we're going to have to drive separately. You know, because I mean, it's whatever you need to do. But I think that leaves a, another option. Like I have to leave at this time because I'm whatever. I need you yeah. know. I have this responsibility that I'm going to. Um, I don't know. I some I sometimes think that that could be creative. Yep. Okay. Uh, what another, else? Another option, another example. The trash has been overflowing for two days. You said you were going to take it out, but you never do what you say you will. Um, I think that's that's criticism because it's talking about character. It's it's character assassination. You ne- it's hyperbole. You never do this, as opposed to what would be general or soft startup, which is something like the trash is overflowing. I need you to take it out as soon as possible, please. And I would add to that, I need you to take it out every night. Mm-hmm. You know, before you go to bed, or or something, so that the cockroaches don't take over our kitchen. <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> but I mean, I think putting a time on it so that your partner says, "Okay, this is something that needs to happen," yeah. because so- sometimes people like let their trash stay there, right? Yep. Two days. I had a roommate who did that. Oh my gosh, I'm going to complain about this roommate. We had a south facing window in Southern California mm-hmm. where we lived, and. I came in one day and the house reeked. I mean, it was horrible. And I knew she was home because I saw her car and yeah. she was back in the bedroom with the door closed. And I'm like, girl, did you not, you know, like what gifts? And she goes, I know there was this terrible smell when I came in the apartment. <laughs> I'm like, really? You, you didn't, didn't like, think, to, do think that. to take an action yeah. about it? Okay, okay. That was my. <laughs> Complaint. You, right. Those old friends who are listening know who I'm talking about. I'm not going to name her. <laughs> uh, so one more, and then we'll kind of wrap it up with a, a couple of okay. a quick pointers. But uh, another one might be you 
never think about how your behavior is affecting other people. I don't believe how forgetful and selfish you are. You never think of others. You never think of me. Uh, this one was in kind of response to never calling, ne- always running late, mm-hmm. um, never letting uh, the partner Obnoxious know. Obnoxious uh, yeah. behavior at a party. That's right. right. Mm-hmm. The complaint might be more something like, I was scared when you were running late and you didn't call me. I thought we had agreed that we would do that for each other. Can you please call me if your plans change or if you're going to be running late? What about the obnoxious at the party one, though? Like The obnoxious like, at the party? Yeah, like your partner just acts ridiculous at a party, you know, mm-hmm. in whatever way, right? Maybe yeah. they have too much to drink or they're kind of a know-it-all or, yeah. you know, how do you address that? I, I think you have to – I think there's a couple things when you're trying to formulate complaints, whether it's about that one or about any of them. And that's identifying what, like we talked about what you need, but because behind every complaint is a wish or a longing is what Mm. Gottman says, that it's, it's an expressed need and that's asking for your partner to help repair or fix. It's a, it's a uh, repair attempt to ask for it. So in that case, it might be something more like, I need to know that I can trust that you're going to be safe and you're going to represent us well at the party. Um, and mm-hmm. who we who we want to be. Can we talk about how to do that? If it continues, it might be something like, I, I want you to have freedom and be able to do what you need to do, but I don't feel like I can continue to go to parties or events with you mm-hmm. um, if this is going to, if this is the way that it's going to be. Yeah, it's really tricky, isn't it? it because is it borders tricky. on control versus and separation, differentiation, Adam, yeah, my you know, of how, you know, who I am and who you are, but also I'm, I mean, I think there is something about, like you said, representing us, what our values are, who we want to be to the world, to people, yeah. being I, safe. I had a couple um, like this a while ago that like it was weddings. They went to a lot of weddings. for They had a big family, so they were mm-hmm. always going to weddings. And one of them would get really drunk at the at the wedding. And when we were able to kind of boil, get down to it, like that was his complaint. You don't, uh, you don't allow me to be myself. I'm just being myself. But when we boiled it down, her the actual need was he was doing unsafe things, and her mm-hmm. need was just to know that he was going to be safe, mm-hmm. right? And that he was going to act in a way that she wasn't going to get request by other family members to calm him down, right? Right. And so those were the things that we were able to ask yeah, for. Yeah, drunk that, and making a pass at the yeah, bridesmaid, probably. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So right. when she was able to ask for that directly that's when it, it was it, that was the need that was the need mm-hmm. was i need to feel like you're going to be safe so i don't have to worry about you and i need for it not to be something that your family members come and complain to me about because they're yeah. not telling you directly yeah. so i mean i think it, it, it's different but i think when you can identify that 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 maybe you can get to what the need is rather than the controlling part of it yeah gosh it's so complicated we know that's complicated yeah but criticism as a pattern is basically representative of people who are on the road toward breakup. Mm -hmm. And so that has to be dealt with. And if you feel like your partner is criticizing and always controlling you, you know, you have to look at how you might be dynamically pulling your partner towards you by withdrawal or refusal to cooperate in some way that would be more effective. So we want you to think about that. We didn't say anything about sex in this because this is a big one, too. I think maybe just ending on the fact that we know, like, one example I have is somebody who says, I told you how I liked it. You know, mm-hmm. you, you don't do that anymore. Or you you always forget in the heat of the moment how I like to be touched. And and to me, again, I think the bedroom is not where you criticize no, um, absolutely the not. sex. I think, you know, don't criticize that one I would the cooking say, in the kitchen. That one I would say, don't do that. Don't complain in the moment there. Yeah, okay. Wait. <laughs> don't, Wait. Don't do you know, that coffee one. on Saturdays and say, hey, look it, I've told you, I really, I really need this, you know, to, to be aroused. And, and it seems like the last several times we've had sex, you, you haven't done that. Can you, you know, I want this to be incorporated in our sex life. Okay. Yep. So you're listening to Four Play Radio Sex Therapy, talking about criticism, one of Gottman's four horsemen of the apocalypse. This is your sex therapist, Lori Watson. And uh, couples therapist, Dr. Adam Matthews. You can now call in your questions to the Four Play Question voicemail. Dial 833-MY4PLAY. That's 833, the number four, play. And we'll use the questions for our mailbag episodes. Hey, help us stay on top here at Four Play. We'd love it if you would subscribe and share it with your friends. And please take one sec and rate and review us. Thanks so much.
All content is for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered as a substitute for therapy by a licensed clinician or as medical advice from a doctor.